it's that time of the week again. It's time for Chit Chat Across the Pond, and this is going to be one of the most uh, unusual interview setups we've ever done. I am still at uh, the CSUN Persons with Disabilities Expo, and I'm joined by three co-hosts. There's no pond here except maybe a glass of water, and I'm going to introduce them one at a time. I have, for the very first time, gotten to meet Dr. Robert Carter of the Tech Doctor Podcast. How are you doing, Robert? I'm great, Allison. It's such a pleasure to finally get to meet you and Steve. Yeah, this has uh, been a long time coming. We've been friends for years and been on each other's shows, and uh, finally getting to meet up is awesome. Yes, and at a situation like this where we have so much going on to promote accessibility and to create an environment where disability really becomes much less of an issue. And you've been such an advocate in this area that it's really great that you're here. So thanks for coming down for the day. Well, like I've always said, this is one of my favorite shows. You guys get the coolest toys. Well, I've also got uh, Allison, and I lost your name again. Hartley. Allison Hartley. I asked her four <laughs> times before we started. I promised I'd forget. Allison Hartley is uh, Robert's uh, co-host on the Tech Doctor podcast, right? Yes, and I'm also a huge fan of your podcast, and it's great to be here. Oh, fantastic. I didn't know you listened. How awesome is that? <laughs> All right, and a good friend for a long time. I actually met back at the Podcast Expo 126 years ago, Shelley Brisbane. Hi, Allison. It's fabulous to be here. I, I like interactive chit chats across the pond where we can actually look at one another. <laughs> yeah, that is kind of a funny thing here. So um, let me explain the setup here. So, so Allison and, uh, and Robert are both completely blind, and Shelly is low vision. And uh, what we wanted to talk about was the changes in iOS 7.1 and kind of what that has brought to these guys and what kind of advantages they've seen. And uh, actually, Steve and I were gone during the, uh, the upgrade and didn't have internets well enough to uh, download the upgrade. So we don't know what it does for sighted people. We're learning what it does for uh, the blind and visually impaired first. So I want to start with Shelly. Um, because you're low vision, you're, the, the challenges you face are different. Um, what are the kinds of things that are happening in terms of, say, uh, contrast, buttons, that sort of thing? Well, as probably a lot of people who have used iOS 7 know, a big issue for everyone was contrast and the ability to read text. Oh, I, it drives me crazy. I can't read anything on this thing. Absolutely. And it was a problem for, for me. It was, was for everybody else. It was just a matter of degree. And so 7.0 had a couple of features that would help you. Uh, there was dynamic type, which allowed you to have, have larger text. There was increased contrast, which was just a toggle. What they've done in OS 7.1 is actually flesh out increased contrast. So there are now three settings that let you customize the, the contrast for the way you want to work. So, for so, so is that, uh, is it just high, medium, and low contrast? No, there's uh, one which reduces transparency. So in screens where it has that sort of uh, fuzzy, bad, well, I call it fuzzy, but the, the background where it's, it's not an opaque background, it will actually reduce that somewhat. Okay, I personally find that really annoying, so I can shut that off now. Yeah, you can, but it's a toggle. See, it's, it's not perfect. I think they're probably going to do more, but at least there's a toggle. It's a starting place for us. There's also a darkened colors, uh, which again goes to making it a little bit easier to see lines and to see, to, not so much with text, that has more to do with background. And then finally there's reduced white point, uh, which pretty much does what it says. So all those sort of blindingly white screens in iOS 7.1 are a little muted when you turn that setting on. Huh, so that, that uh, does that work system-wide on all apps or does the app developer have to recognize those toggles? No, those are system-wide and that's a nice thing from a evangelizing to developers point of view. You don't have to do anything, it's just I think you're going to see most of the effects on the home screen and in Apple Apps, but if you're using sort of static, standard backgrounds I should say, you're going to notice it. And I think that the issue for people is going to be finding out which combination of those settings works. So you can turn them all on and you might not need all of them on. So as a low vision person I spent my first few days with iOS 7.1 going off, on, on, off, off, on, and had a lot of fun. <laughs> I love I it. finally have some settings that I thought I kind of like, a combination. Yeah, you might want to memorize those. Yeah, exactly. So one of the things that really bugs the daylights out of me in iOS is that they got rid of buttons. So like the back button and the done button and all that, that's all just text. And I find it, I find them hard to find because of that. My personal new favorite feature in iOS 7.1 is called button shapes. And again, it's a toggle and it does two things. It highlights some buttons, for example, the back button, which is now just an arrow in text, and it creates a highlighted back, a background that is highlighted behind the text. It doesn't highlight the text itself, but it creates a, a background. It's like you if you took a highlighter and put it on the background. And the other thing it does is it underlines some text links so that if you have uh, an alert with a cancel and an OK button, for example, those uh, 
text buttons would be underlined for you. And it's just great, and I use it all the time. So this is kind of funny. When Shelly showed us this, uh, by the way, these settings are under general accessibility. And then uh, uh, in the button shapes, as soon as she told us about it, Steve, Robert's wife, Vicki, and I, who are all completely sighted, immediately turned those button shapes on and went, yay, that's so much better. Let me, let me ask Robert a quick question. With the, uh, with the underlying text turning on, does that change how it acts in voiceover? It does not. It doesn't change anything in voiceover. Okay, so that has no impact on you. You can sit there and flip those switches all day and you don't care. Correct. Okay, great. Uh, any other, uh, oh, the, how about the bolding? That was fun. Bold text, uh, that, and, and that, that's an interesting one. That's been in 7.0, but what they've done is accentuate the effects of it. So when you turn on the bold text toggle, the first thing is it'll say, we're going to restart your phone. So you just wait a minute, have a cup of coffee, have a sip of coffee, I should say. It doesn't take that long. Uh, but in addition to what it, the first thing it, that you'll notice is that it bolds the text underneath icons on your home screen. The second thing you'll notice is that if you pull up the search keyboard or any keyboard, it will make the uh, keys stand out from the backgrounds more, whether that's light or dark, depends on the keyboard. Uh, and then the other thing is, in addition to text, they've actually added some lines that are, it, it's hard to say to point at them and say, well, this is actually a new line, but there are, are lines around uh, the borders of icons, so they're just a little bit easier to see. They pop out from the background a little bit more. Okay. I noticed also, like I brought up my email, and the subject of every email was a dark, uh, very dark, bold uh, title now. Uh, yeah, I, th I think, yeah, that must be part of bold text. I, I can't quantify it one way or another, but I think, I think that's probably a function of that. We've been playing with all these settings, and like I say, there's the different combinations I'm still kind of experimenting with, but... Uh, can, you, can you change the bolding? Like, is it a low, medium, high, or is it just no. bold or no bold? It's just bold or no bold, unfortunately. But, but I mean, it's not, it's not terribly obtrusive. I think for most people, it'll probably be fine. But my sort of overarching theory of low vision accessibility in iOS is that it continues to be a work in progress. And I said that when 7.0 came out, and when you did increase contrast, and then you went to a screen with only one toggle on it, I said, they're going to put more stuff on that. And I, I think they're still going to do that. I think it's, and pe they, they take a lot of feedback, and they get a lot of feedback, certainly from people like me. So I don't know whether they'll do, say, a high, medium, and low bold. Probably not. I would think it would be more likely that they would do sliders in the contrast realm so that you could oh, turn that'd be nice. up and down a little bit. Yeah, so um, one of the reasons I, I think the low vision stuff is really interesting on Into the Blind stuff is basically as we age, if we're lucky enough to age, we pretty much all can expect to have lower and lower vision. I mean, it, it, you don't hear about people going, wow, I can sure see better than I did 10 years ago. Uh, and and uh, if we live long enough, we're probably going to be blind. So I figure it's good for everybody to learn about this stuff. But I want to switch gears a little bit and go to Allison, who Allison is really, really excited about some bugs that are gone. What What's yeah, uh, blown your dress were, up? There were a couple of bugs that were introduced in iOS 7.0 that drove me absolutely nuts. Um, when you would push the sleep-wake button to lock the screen, a voiceover, as it should, would announce screen locked. And then every now and then randomly, again, you would hear screen locked, screen locked. <laughs> and I wanted to throw my phone out the window. <laughs> like, you got, I got it. I understand. Yeah, I understand the screen is locked. But yeah, they fixed that in 7.1, thank God. And also another really um, obtrusive bug that was bugging me was um, if you were typing in a text input field, whether that would be an iMessage or composing a tweet, and if you were using the on-screen keyboard and you just overshot just a tad and you went up into the content of whatever it is you were typing, um, focus would randomly jump. And so you'd think you were chugging along typing at the end of, of your text and it would go just somewhere in the middle and that. So it would uh, allow you to keep typing except mm -hmm. to change where it was it typing. Would, it would change where and it would not alert you that it was doing so. It would, it, it was. That's really just mean. It was terribly mean. I, uttered several profanities over that. We call those non-Girl Scout safe words on my show. <laughs> so they fixed that. Yes. Yes, they have. So what is the warning now? Now, it, it, still, it still lets you know that you're in the, like, in the message area and it still reads out the text when you touch it, but focus doesn't change. That's the big, um, that's the big change. Oh, okay. So they didn't just warn you. They fixed the bug so it doesn't lose focus. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, very cool. Any more bugs that are exciting you? Um, not me, but Robert has one that he's quite passionate about. All right, let's, uh, let's flip over to Robert then. What's this bug you're talking about? Well, the bug that I'm talking about is one that sort of got a lot of attention when iOS 7.1 was released, and people that I heard on Twitter kind of panicked a bit. 
it's a Bluetooth keyboard bug, and they actually tried to fix a problem that was in iOS 7.0 when you use the Bluetooth keyboard with voiceover turned on, you're supposed to be able to tap the control key anytime you want voiceover to shut up. And they fix so that. Just, that's the same way on a regular keyboard, right? Yeah, same on a regular keyboard if, if, if you're on a Mac, for example. But in iOS, it, it was broken in 7.0. It didn't actually shut up voiceover. But they fixed that in 7.1. So now the control key does shut up voiceover. But unfortunately, they broke another piece of it, <laughs> which great. is that when you tap the control key by itself, the Bluetooth keyboard stops operating in your edit box. So you won't, you'll keep typing, but you won't, you won't have any text being entered. Are, are you notified that you're not typing? Yeah, you, well, you can quickly tell that nothing is happening the way it should be because it'll just start saying tab, 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 or some random uh, things. And it, so that sounds worse than it was before. W yes, it, it's, it's, a, it's a breakage. But the good news is it's not as bad as people first thought. People thought this was some random bug that you could not reproduce. You couldn't figure out what was happening. But what's actually happening is... Right now, it's just the fact that you press control by itself to silence voiceover that causes the bug. But if you go ahead then and press control and option together and release those two keys together, or release option uh, before you release the control key, then the bug will go away and you can continue typing in your edit field. So there's a, a pretty easy workaround to it, and they'll eventually fix it. They didn't mean for it to happen this way. It seems sort of like if you, if I was fixing bug A, I would have noticed bug B, wouldn't you think? Well, a lot of people are critical that, that, that it wasn't noticed or that it wasn't fixed. And, you know, to be honest, I mean, I, I'm not thrilled that it's there, but when I really think about it, Allison, I've been using voiceover on iOS devices since the iPhone 3GS, and every single new version of the operating system has added more and more capabilities for voiceover. So, you know, if Apple's like any other place, they're going to make a mistake now and then, and I, I don't want to be too hard on them about that. You know, they'll fix it, and it's, I don't want to focus on the, just the bug, because a lot of progress was made in 7.1. I, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, I'm, I'm curious what you think about, um, I, there was there was some uh, investors thing, uh, maybe it was a conference call, I forget, where um, a guy was asking um, uh, Tim Cook to justify with an ROI why they're doing all these green initiatives. Yes. Yes. And his answer was, I don't do no stinking ROI on that. And by the way, I don't do it when I make things accessible to the blind either. Did you guys love that? Loved it, loved it, loved it. <laughs> yeah. And it really is, I think, a, a, an honest statement about where Tim Cook's heart is as far as accessibility. And, and the culture of the whole company is driven by that, right? Yes, the culture is driven by that. And I'm so glad he did it because people have so much wanted to start rumors that now that Steve Jobs has passed, that Apple's going to forget about accessibility. And I don't even, we don't really even know for sure that Steve Jobs was the one really driving that, although he did speak about it occasionally at the keynotes and things. But he could have stopped it, but maybe it was driven more by somebody else. Maybe, but, but the point is, it's very clear that Tim Cook not only is planning to continue it, but is very committed to it. Yeah, that is fantastic. What about, uh, are there any enhancements in uh, 7.1 that excite you? Yes, um, th there are actually a few that, that are exciting. Uh, one thing that's really nice now is that uh, VoiceOver allows you to use multiple speech synthesizers, and it has for a while. You can switch, for example, from American English to Australian English. But now for the first time in 7.1, you can have independent speed settings for each of those voices. So if you can understand uh, American English at a more rapid speed, that's great, but you can slow it, have it automatically slow down a bit when you switch to Australian English. What an interesting... That, that is something I would have never thought of. That's fascinating. Yeah, and I think it's it's going to be really useful for people who, you know, you make it, you may decide you're tired of reading in one one version of English, or maybe you even want to switch to French or Spanish or a different language to read something. And it's nice to have the, those voices a bit more customizable in that way. Well, that's interesting. Now, if, forgive me for my ignorance here, but um, do you buy separate voices for iOS, or you just use what comes with They're it? All built in. No, those, those voices that that are that come with VoiceOver and iOS are, are built in. Oh, okay. And uh, how many voices are built in now? 
I don't know how many are built in. Do you know, today. Allison? There are quite a few. Many. I, I know that there are at least six or seven English voices alone. Yeah, and then there are oh, wow. of other languages as well. Okay. Okay. Anything else uh, really blowing your dress up there, Robert? <laughs> well, I can't say that I actually wear a dress too often, Allison, but... <laughs> too often. <laughs> but, okay, I don't, can't say that I wear one at all. <laughs> okay, no rumors. No Let's rumors. clarify these rumors here before they even get started. The although, esteemed prof although, professor says what? <laughs> well, I, I'm, I'm, I've worn a kilt, so I may try a dress sometime. There you go, there but, you go. But He's open-minded. Yes, I, I'm being, trying to be very open-minded about this. But really, I think what has happened is that that iOS 7.1 just continues that iterative process of making voiceover work more smoothly and making it work well with the apps that come on the phone. And of course, we're always excited when developers do a little bit extra to make their apps completely voiceover friendly. And so nothing in particular jumps out at me, but it, I'm just thrilled with the way this process is, is evolving. So continuing to polish the diamond then. Absolutely. <laughs> ever forward yeah <laughs> there you go well um i'm people who have listened to the show for a long time know that i took a big risk and uh was it a year ago or two years ago steve i uh I did a, uh, a session at Macworld called Blindfolded, where I wore, a, uh, I wore a blindfold and I used the iPhone and the Mac blindfolded. Um, I was highly successful on the iPhone and I crashed and burned in a, in a deadly fire on the, uh, on the Mac. But, but you I, worked your way through it. Well, technically I took the blindfold off is how I worked through it. Okay. I, got, I got a document stuck to me. Like imagine something stuck to the bottom of your shoe and you keep walking around in a circle because you're stuck there. I couldn't get this document off the bottom of my foot. Yeah. And I never, I never did figure out what caused it. Yeah. I do know what caused it though is I changed something at the last minute right before I walked into the session, which you never do. Right. But anyway, w my point was that um, even the two years ago, I found iOS 7 or, or I actually would have been iOS 6 back then. Yes. Maybe two years ago. Anyway, it was. I found it very easy to learn. I found it, it intuitive. I mean, I wasn't good at it, but I understood it. I knew what all the pieces were. I even. Uh, I finally even figured out what that silly rotor thing was for. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, so, that may have been iOS five or six, but you, you got on that pretty early on. And my hats off to you for doing that blindfolded because it really made a great statement about how powerful accessibility is. I think it, it did also help that I crashed and burned. A lot of people in the session said that it also showed how hard it was, that it wasn't just a drop in the, you know, a e easy peasy. And so it is difficult to use, but you can do it. It's more difficult if you can't see the screen because of course this is a OS 10 and iOS, what are they? Touch screens and icons. They're totally designed to be visual. Well, I actually told everybody that they would never make an accessible iPhone. That was just silly. That couldn't be done. So I'm a visionary. Anyway, any other last minute things or should we start closing this out? Shelly, you got anything else? Well, I, I guess I would just echo some of what Robert said about the iterative process that Apple's going through. And I think 7.1, I call it the low vision upgrade. It's the best upgrade that low vision users have ever had because it provides the most variety of features and as I said before I think what's exciting is that you have the ability to customize the low vision experience for whatever your needs are and everybody who's low vision has slightly different needs and I think that bodes well for all kinds of accessibility including something we didn't talk about it's not new in 7.01 but the addition of switch control so that folks who can't use their hands to manipulate the, the devices can use uh, head mounted switches or Bluetooth switches that they communicate that they can tap in other ways and that's an interface that's just getting more and more robust with each iteration as well so I think there's an incredible amount of additional stuff accessibility can do and it's amazing that these pieces of glass and steel can be made as accessible as they are and that there's such a large ecosystem as you see when you go to the sessions at this conference where people are using iOS in incredible numbers of different applications whether it's publishing or education and uh, and I, you know, I'm amazed that I live with this stuff every day. So it's 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 a pretty awesome time to be writing about and uh, and, and living with the technology that actually works for folks who have different disabilities. Yeah, I'm I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, last week on the show, uh, the Mac Mommy was on talking with Alistair Jenks about. Uh, teaching people to use uh, iOS and the Mac and that sort of thing. And, and, and she teaches elderly people is kind of her specialty as she goes into people's homes and helps them set up their Mac and their iOS devices. So I think she's probably going to be pretty excited to hear about the... <laughs> Shelly just said, could she come to my mom's house? Probably. Uh, fly her out there. 
Uh, but anyway, that since she goes to their houses to know that this stuff is available, and, and a lot of us have aging parents who maybe we can help them out with the, the low vision things as well and get them more excited to say, hey, if I turn this switch, is that better or worse? If I turn this switch, better or worse? Kind of like being at the eye doctor where they say, is it better or worse? Oh, yeah. All right, well, let's start uh, closing this out. Shelly, you have a book coming out. Tell us about it. Why, yes, Alice and I certainly do. Uh, I'm almost completed a book called iOS Access for All, your comprehensive guide to accessibility on the iPad, iPhone, and iPod Touch. And the title, you would think that would say it all, wouldn't you? Uh, basically, it's your how-to guide. If you want to know everything to, everything to do with how to use accessibility, it's not so much, it's not very abstract at all. It's follow these steps and you'll learn how to use a Bluetooth keyboard or a braille display with a voiceover or use the vision tools. And so I cover all of the different groups of accessibility uh, features in terms of different disability types. And then I have a couple of chapters about apps. I go into depth as to how to use the accessibility features with Apple apps and then also with third-party apps. And that's about to come out in uh, three weeks or so here. And uh, you can find out more at iosaccessbook.com. Oh, fantastic, fantastic. I will make sure I'll put a link in the show notes to that for people. If I, if I uh, take a picture of this QR code on the back of your card and I put it on my website, would that work? That probably would work, sure. <laughs> All right, we'll give it a try. And Allison, how can people find you? Well, Robert and I co-host the Tech Doctor podcast, and the best way to find us is to head on over to dr-carter.com. We podcast where we talk not only about new innovations in technology, but try to get an idea of uh, get to know the people behind it a little better. We're both in the helping profession in our day jobs, so we like to say that we intersect uh, the human aspect of technology in our podcast. Oh, fantastic. One of my, one of my top shows. Robert, we're going to close it out here. Well, Allison, you know, I am a bit biased here, but <laughs> I will have to say that I do study the technology pretty carefully, at least the accessible technology, and I am absolutely convinced that Apple is well more than a country mile ahead of the other big companies in accessibility at this time. And I would encourage anyone who, who needs accessibility to take a careful look at what Apple has to offer because it's a lot right now. That's fantastic. And how can people find you? People can find me by sending an email to techdoctor at dr-carter.com. All right. Thank you very much. This was fantastic. A great panel. Uh, I tricked these people into it. I had them uh, stuck here during lunch, so I tricked them into it. I appreciate you guys all for coming. Thank you. You're welcome.